The following Hour of Power is made possible through generous donations and offerings by viewers like you. From Southern California, welcome to the Hour of Power. This week, Pastor Bobby welcomes the Hour of Power Dixieland Band. The Hour of Power Choir. And a special message from Pastor Bobby entitled, Sermon on the Mount, Praying Like Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, we're just so glad that all of you have come here today. Uh, many of us have come here excited about the new year. Some of us have come here with some bad news. Some of us have come here with health concerns, money concerns. For whatever reason you're here, we recognize the presence of God, his healing power, and his purpose for your life. And so we're so glad that you've come, and we hope that today you leave feeling refreshed, renewed, and encouraged. Turn to those who are standing next to you. Greet them warmly in the name of the Lord. Say, God loves you and so do I. Let's pray. Father, yes, God, we're so grateful that you've called us to this place. We come here with reverence and respect and love. And we recognize that you're here and that you've never left. And we pray, Father, that everything we do today would give glory to Jesus. I pray for peace, for wisdom, for goodness, for everyone here. Lord, thank you for all you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. That was a great amen. The scripture this morning, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Thank you. Yeah. 
Good morning. We're so glad that you're watching the Hour of Power, and we are hoping that as you're watching, you're feeling encouraged and lift up. That's exactly what we want to do here at the Hour of Power. We want to reach people in their homes, on their computer screens, in their offices, to remind them of God's love and power in the midst of all sorts of difficult circumstances. For those of you out there who are stressed out, who are worried, who are angry, who just got some really bad news, we want to tell you to smile and to stop worrying and trust in a big God who is there for you today. That's the vision of Hour of Power. We believe in finding people right where they're at and encouraging them with the love and hope and great power that is found in God's life and goodness. You know, at the beginning of the summer, we were worried. We were stressed out because we were thinking, we have this mammoth undertaking to move from the Crystal Cathedral over to Shepherd's Grove and we thought, how is this even going to happen? And we asked you and many others to help us in this difficult move and you came through. We can't thank you enough. And so we're reminding you once again of the words of Jesus. He said, look to the birds of the air, look at the flowers of the field. God provides for them. And that's a reminder to you as well in your difficult times. Don't be worried, don't be stressed, smile because today is a gift from God to you and enjoy today. I want to pray a special prayer for all of those of you who are suffering and in difficult times. God, we come to you and we know that you are bigger than cancer. We know that you're bigger than debt. We know that you are bigger than strife and relationships. You're bigger than our jobs. Lord, we are trusting you and believing in you to help us overcome. Give us a hope, renewal, uh, and life in the midst of difficult circumstances. We trust you, Jesus. You are shepherding us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, friends. We hope you continue to be encouraged today in the hour of power. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. You may have already received our Hour of Power television survey in your mailbox. If you have, please complete the survey and return it as soon as possible. If you'd like to take your survey online, go to hourofpower.org. Just look for the survey indicator and follow the instructions. We want to be here for you every week, but we need your help to be effective. We will say thank you by sending our Good Shepherd Hour of Power lapel pin. This one-of-a-kind pin displays the heartbeat of this ministry, belonging, healing, and learning. The letters are shaped in gold and set in a deep navy blue background. Wear this lapel pin as a proud supporter of the Hour of Power we're asking for a gift of any size. With your donation today, the Hour of Power can and will be on the air each week, bringing you the most inspirational hour on television. The address is Hour of Power, Box 100, Garden Grove, California, or call toll-free 1-866-GET-HOPE. That's 1-866-438-4673. Of course, you can also go online and request your Good Shepherd lapel pin at hourofpower.org. In Canada, the address is Hour of Power, Post Office Box 9050, Surrey, British Columbia, or call toll-free 1-866-581-7654. Of course, you can also go online at hourofpower.ca. Thank you again for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. Thank you. 
Thank you, Our Power Dixieland Band. We love you guys. That was wonderful. Yeah. I also want to say a special thanks to Aaron McClaskey, who's been playing organ and piano for us today. So thank you, Aaron, for coming. We appreciate you. All right. You ever made a promise that you broke? Uh, I did. A promise to myself. It was a promise that I wouldn't fly a certain airline. They'd lost my bag several times. I'd found myself stuck on a tarmac for hours with no air conditioning, until one time I finally swore I would never fly this particular airline ever again. And the one time I broke that promise was a time when I specifically, I always tell people, don't ever put me on this airline. And that one time I broke that promise, I was on the airline. I was like, okay, they got my ticket, I'll just do it anyway. I'm coming back from Dallas, Dallas to Orange County with my wife. And it's a fine flight. It was amazing. They didn't, you know, up to this point we actually took off on time. The air conditioning worked. I'm going along, and we're about to descend on Orange County, and yet we're still pretty high, and we just go right over Orange County Airport. Okay. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and we're still pretty high, it's just ocean. And ocean. And like 20 minutes later, I'm like, are we on our way to Hawaii? What's going on here? <laughs> My wife and I are sitting there and a, a pilot, have you ever heard the voice of a pilot that's a little shaken? <laughs> it's not a comforting feeling. What do they say? It's better, the, there's an old pilot proverb that says something like, I'd rather be on the ground wanting to be up in the sky than, wanting, than being up in the sky wanting to be on the ground. And it sounds like what this, pi this uh, pilot was about to say. He says, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, the such and such flaps on the side of the plane are not operating. <laughs> he says, we can turn the plane, but we can't slow it down. <laughs> he says, we're gonna perform an, an emergency landing at LAX. It has a long enough runway, and this will be a, a highly dangerous such and such emergency crash landing. The flight attendants are freaking out. That never happens. I'm always astonished when I fly when like if the plane is topsy-turvy. I feel like that guy from Lost that didn't have a seatbelt on that hits the ceiling. If you watch that show, you know what I'm talking about? I, and the, then usually the flight attendants are like, it's no big deal, been there, done that. These flight attendants were like, seatbelts on, seatbelts on. Heads down! You will keep your heads down at all times. We all had our heads in our laps like this, you know, almost kissing our own bottoms. This is what I feel like, an idiot. And the whole time, of course, I'm thinking, the one time I broke this cardinal rule not to fly this horrible airline, I did, and this is what happens. And we're getting close to LAX going really fast. And uh, as we get close to the ground, I'm kind of peeking out the window, and I've never seen buildings going like, foo, 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 foo. <laughs> you know, like, the flight attendants are shouting in, at, at, the, uh, at the passengers saying, heads down, heads down. I have a feeling mine was one of those heads. 
I'm not sure. And, uh, and as we come close, I peek, I kind of like look out the side of the window, and driving alongside are a bunch of fire trucks and ambulances going side by side with the plane. As this is happening, as we're getting close to the runway, Hannah grabs my hand and she says, let's pray. So we prayed and, uh, and she looked at me, she's the smart one, you know. She said, everything's gonna be just fine, I know it, after we prayed. Now I have a feeling that I wasn't, we weren't the only ones praying on that plane. One of the funny things about that experience was how calm everybody was. I was surprised by that. I always thought an experience like that people would be freaking out. And everybody was just like very just stoic and calm and, and all of this, right? But I know there were people on that plane that were praying that don't normally pray. <laughs> As we came close to the runway, the pilot did this thing. I, I talked to my, my grandpa, Kerry, who's a, who's a pilot, and he explained this to me. But basically, we came down, and the wheels hit the runway, and then the airplane went back into flight. So it went, oop, and then it was flying over the runway for another minute or so. I couldn't believe how long the runway was. And then it hit again, oop, and then went back in the air and still flying. And essentially, that's what they were doing to slow the plane down. And then the third or fourth one, it just went, goo, a nice smooth landing. You know, if he hadn't said anything, we would not have known there was an emergency landing. And Carrie said it was a very dangerous situation, but and we just landed and everything was fine. And then he said, we all have the opportunity. We're going to switch planes and fly you to Orange County. And everybody was like, no! <laughs> I can drive 45 minutes to Orange County, you know? <laughs> Traffic in LA is bad, but not that bad, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, the funniest thing was when we landed, it was like And as the plane started to slow down, you could feel the tension just drop in the plane. And one guy in the plane goes, it's good to be alive! And everybody in the plane goes, yeah! You know? <laughs> this great thing. And the whole point, I, the whole reason I say that is, today we're talking about prayer. And prayer is the most natural thing that people do. I've often thought that prayer didn't come out of religion, but religion comes out of prayer. There are times when we're in situations like that plane. Even, even those of you who are not religious or at all or didn't grow up going to church or synagogue or whatever, you don't have any religious background or anything, and you would be on that plane and you know somehow you'd be like, if somebody's up there, please help me out here. I don't want to die in a plane crash. Life is good, right? There is something about the human being that particularly when things get bad, we want to turn our eyes heavenward and pray to something or someone. Praying is natural for human beings. And I guess the message I want to give you today is essentially this. Don't wait until you're in an airplane crash to pray. <laughs> and that's what most of us do. We, we come to God and we come in a life of prayer only when things get bad. You know, that's, that is not the, the, the way that disciples are meant to live. Of course you go. To, to go to God in prayer when things are bad, is, yes, you should do that. But don't wait till then. Prayer is so good and it should be used every day. Today we're going back into the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer. But before I get there, I just want to give a few reflections on, on prayer itself. Now, I tried to think about what prayer is for a Christian, for a disciple of Christ. And if I wanted to oversimplify it, I would say prayer is, and I want you to hear this, prayer is letting go. Prayer is letting go. Not letting go in the sense that like I quit and I give up, but letting go in the sense that I know if I release this thing to God that everything will turn out better. Prayer is letting go. Now, in other religions, that is certainly not the case. If you look at other worldviews and religions, most religions have some kind of view of God or the gods as these sort of wrathful, angry, vengeance kind of driven deities that, you know, are temperamental and emotional and, you know, are just out to get us. Some people have this view of, of God and Christianity. And so prayer, some of these other religions, will create... Ways in which we appease the gods to hear our voice. And that has leaked so often into Christianity. And that is not how Christians pray. Praying for a Christian does not mean, what can I do to be more eloquent? Or how can I be in a more sacred space? Or uh, 
or whatever? How can I make some kind of a sacrifice of my money or time to get God to hear me better? How can I get someone else who's more spiritual than me to pray for me so that God might l listen to them to listen to me? That's not how Christians pray. Christianity says, I believe, that prayer is essentially letting go. That when we pray, whether we're pr asking God for something or whether we're asking for forgiveness or for help or for guidance or for insight, it always has this theme of essentially saying, not my will but yours be done. It always has this, this sort of core value to it that, God, I am troubled by this, but I release it to you. And you know what? Christians have every reason to let go to God. Because God is a good God who loves us. He's like a kid who is like dangling from the roof or, or something, and the dad says, just let go, I'll catch you. And we'll say, no! He says, just let go, I'll catch you. God is good. And we can trust him. And we can pray to him. And there really isn't a right or wrong way to pray necessarily. I mean, in fact, that's the crux of the Sermon on the Mount and, and, and the, the Lord's Prayer is essentially saying that you need to stop trying to manipulate God or influence God. Prayer is letting go. Prayer is, for the Christian, the greatest, I think, source of power and grace. It's the thing that energizes us and gives us fuel to be Jesus' kind of people. The most important thing I think about prayer is the fact that we realize we can't do life on our own. It gives us an incredible power to say to God very simply, I am wounded, I am broken, I am a sinner, I am lost, and I need you. And I can't do this on my own, and I need your help. And prayer is the way in which we recognize that God doesn't go anywhere. We don't, when we pray, ask God to be a part of our life. Rather, when we pray, we're acknowledging that he's right there with us, that he's been with us since we were born, and that he's listening. And then what that does is as we walk through our life and hard things come, we know because of our training that God is there with us. God is always around, and this is important. I used to imagine when I was a little kid, what would it would be like if my dad was always around? My dad was super cool. I, I have a great dad. I remember once when I was a kid, he, or lots of times, I would, he loved not to go fishing on Saturdays, like when I didn't have school. He loved to go fishing during the school day. And he would take me to school first. So I would, like, I would go to school, and I'd be there for a couple hours, and you know, just, you're in third grade or fourth grade, and you just don't want to be there, and you have to do math or something, you know, horrible. And then all of a sudden, a kid comes in with a note, and the teacher looks up at the room, and everybody goes, oh. Who gets to leave? And they say, Bobby Schuler. Yes! You know, he's dead. <laughs> There's dad, and I'm like, what's? And the first time I was like, what's wrong? He's like, what's wrong is that we have a boat and it doesn't have fish in it. <laughs> We're going fishing. <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, there's something about when your dad is around, that things are easier. You know, if you got bullied at school or if you had kids picking on you, they wouldn't do it if your dad was around. There's, there's things about life in general that, that as a kid, if your dad's around, you don't have to really worry about anything because you know dad will take care of it. For the Christian, in a spiritual sense, knowing dad's around, there is, there is that sense as a child sort of releases their life in trust to a parent, a mother or a father that loves them, that's with them, that will give them the food they need, that will take them to the place they need to go, that will protect them from, you know, dangerous and scary kids and all these types of things, that will pr help them push on through challenges and will, will teach them when they don't have answers to difficult questions. That's the same way. That's, that's what prayer does. It reminds us and turns our ear toward the voice of God. It reminds us that God is always there and will never leave us and loves us and is a plan for us and that everything that we're doing, no matter how bad, he has a plan to overcome it for our lives. So that the, the prayer becomes a necessity in the, in the disciples' ability to live like Jesus. All of these things that we're talking about when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, loving your enemies and not being an angry person and not lying or managing your reputation, not worrying. That stuff is impossible without a life of prayer. Prayer must be your daily sustenance. I mean, even Jesus needed to pray. 
Jesus is God and he needed to pray. Jesus' ministry begins with his baptism and God just lavishes him with love and favor, even though he hasn't really done anything yet. And out of that place of God's love and goodness, Jesus then goes into the wilderness to be again alone with, with the Father for 40 days and then here comes the devil and the devil tempts him and all this stuff. And, and you just constantly see Jesus, whether it's in Gethsemane or just withdrawing to what's called the lonely places in the Bible. Jesus continually withdraws to be in prayer, to know that the Father is with him and that the Father has called him to receive guidance from the Father. And so if, if Jesus needed prayer, I mean, I think I do. And so the, the Christian life is a life that should be saturated with prayer. It should just be complete. Your life should just be covered. And you should be praying when you get up. You should pray before your meals. You should pray for your friends when they say bad things are happening. If you're going to have an important meeting, take five minutes and just pray. I mean, it's just a good thing to do. I believe that if every single person, every single Christian, in fact, had a 20-minute quiet time every morning, that the whole world would be different. How different would your life be if you took 20 minutes or 30 minutes every morning just to, to be in a secret, special, beautiful place with God for 30 minutes and just pray and listen to him and think about your day and have a vision for your day and what your day would be like? Over the years, how, how different would your, would your life be? I think most of us think, man, if I took just 20 minutes every morning and just spent some time praying and listening and reflecting... I think my life would be totally different. Now, here's another question. What's more important to you, God or money? All of us would say, God is more important than money, which is really not true for most of us. <laughs> let, me t let me ask you a question. If, we, if you say, my relationship with God, I could see it thriving and flourishing so much more if I just spent 20 minutes every morning with the Lord. Uh, but I just, I, I don't know, I can't make the time to do that. What if I told you, I will give you $10 million in a briefcase if you can have a 20-minute quiet time every single morning for one year. How many of you would do that? Yeah, you don't want to raise your hand, do you? <laughs> because what you're saying there is that money is more important to you than your relationship with God. If you don't have a quiet time now without a briefcase full of $10 million bucks but you would do it if you got the money. Money's more important to you than God. Ah, that burns. Now, I'm talking to myself here <laughs> because I try and have a quiet time every morning and I don't, you know, but, but I think, man, I would do it if, if there were money involved or I would do it if there were some kind of material reward, you know, and, and that gives us a clue into sort of where we are and, and again, how, how much we need prayer. I don't say that to condemn you or to judge you, except just to say that you may not love God as much as you think you do. That's all. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about prayer, the reason you pray, when you pray 20 minutes in the morning, is it's you essentially admitting to God that you can't do your life on your own. When you stop every single morning and say, just for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, you just say, God, I can't, I can't do today without you. You are saying that, that you yield your life to God and that's where all power comes from for Christians. We don't, we don't win through willpower and through trying harder. Christians have all power by having communion with the Father. It's kind of like AA. You know, I love AA or Alcoholics Anonymous or some of the other, other groups because what they do is they say, I am broken and I have no power to overcome this horrible thing in my life. And so the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous or any of the addiction things is to simply just abandon uh, your ability to control your life to a higher power, right? Right? And the, the great thing about that is that those are the people that admit that they need God, even though all of us do. I mean, all of us are broken and all of us need God. And so prayer is a rhythm in which we say, God, I need you. If you don't have a life of prayer, you essentially believe that, that you don't need God in the ways that 
the Bible says in order to be the person that you want to be in Christ. So students go to class, athletes go to the gym, Christians go to the prayer closet. That's what we do. You cannot be a true disciple of Christ without a daily, ongoing life of prayer. And I tell you this, not because I'm angry or judging you, but I'm telling you because I love you. And a life of prayer will bring such fullness and richness to your, your job. The job that you hate will become a job you like. Your husband or wife you don't get along with, all of a sudden you'll love them more. Your kids won't be a burden to you. They'll be a blessing to you. All of a sudden you'll start treating your neighbor with dignity and respect. And it doesn't happen overnight, but you'll see that over the months, just taking some time each day to be with Jesus will change your life. It will change your life. And so many of us say, well then, how do I pray? And this brings us to the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, he, he first begins by saying, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who pray standing on the street corners and in the synagogues to be seen by men. He's talking about the religious guys like me, the pastors of the day that used to go and say, oh God, and they'd pray these great eloquent prayers to show how spiritual they are. And he'd say, no, 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 don't be like them. You don't need to show off your spirituality. People don't need to see you praying. In fact, what I want you to do is to go to a very secret place because that's where God is. He says, and then your father who is or lives in a secret place will hear your prayer. Now that is a cool thing. The first thing we learn from the Sermon on the Mount is that when we pray, we ought to go to a very secret place. And I think we ought to go to, a very, if you have time, if you would make time, go to a very beautiful place. Go somewhere in which you feel like God is so real to you and so beautiful to you. I often talk about my favorite place, Peter's Canyon. But somewhere private, somewhere safe, Somewhere beautiful. And when that happens, when you're there, you get to be your real self. You get to talk about all of your stuff to God. And he'll meet you there. Then Jesus says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Anybody seen Christians that babble on like pagans when they pray? When you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. But when you pray, this is how you pray. And then he, about, he goes, but what I think that means, you know, we actually have on record pagan prayers from the Roman Empire where pagans would list every god they can think of. Zeus, Athena, whatever, Neptune, or just, I, I don't, I always get the Greek ones and the Roman ones mixed up. I almost said Zeus, Apollo, it's the same god. Anyway, and they would list all of these gods and, and hoping that that one of them would hear. I, I think probably during the day too, in, in Jesus' day, there were lots of, of Jewish pastors who would really put a lot of thought into making the perfect prayer. And so religious people would say, well, I want to get this prayer perfect. I want to get it right. And I, I want it to be a long prayer and, and in depth because then maybe God will hear me. Jesus says, don't worry about it. I mean, that is really what he's saying is, when you pray, don't worry about doing it right. Don't worry about saying the right things. I get all sorts of questions like, do I pray to Jesus or do I pray to the Father? It's like, just whichever one you want. Do I, when I pray, do I need to say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do I need to do it in the name of Jesus? I'm like, those are all good things. Do them, but don't worry. Just stop worrying about it. Just go and be with God and say, Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm here. And so then it begins... The Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you pray, this is how you should do it. Our Father. Now that right there could be its own sermon. He says, our Father. First of all, first person plural. He doesn't say my Father. Anytime you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying in community with all Christians, even if you're completely alone. By saying our Father, you recognize that everyone who's praying this prayer is your brother and sister. It's also amazing that Jesus doesn't say our God or that Je Jesus doesn't say our Adonai you know, or the name of God. But he says our dad, our father, our Abba. That was fresh. 
He essentially begins by saying, God, you're our dad. Our dad. I mean, when you say it like that, you know, it, it changes it. A loving, good father. Who art in heaven. This is the most misunderstood part of the prayer. The, the, the word heaven there is plural. It should say, who fills the heavens. That means that God, the word who art in heaven, heaven is plural. And in Jesus' day, heaven didn't mean just heaven like we go to when we die. But heaven was also the sky. Heaven was the stars and the planets. And heaven was the air around you. So when Jesus said, our Father who art in heaven, he's referring to the physical space around us. That God literally fills the space around us. And then he says, hallowed be thy name. He essentially says, we treasure and value your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And essentially says, I want you to be the king of my life. I want everything that I do, I want everything that you want in my life. Give us this day our daily bread. That means just give us what we need. Again, there's the us form. When you say, give us this day our daily bread, you're essentially saying, I want you to give my neighbor his daily bread, and I want you to give him his daily bread and my daily bread. Give me what I need. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Here's the most incredible part of the Lord's Prayer. Are you ready to say that, really? When you say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, you are saying, forgive us to the same degree that we have forgiven those who have hurt us. Think of one or two people, think of the person that you have forgiven the least in your life. When you say forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, you're asking God to forgive you to the degree that you have forgiven that person that you haven't forgiven very much. Do you understand what you're saying when you say that? Forgive us our debts to the same degree that we forgive our debtors. And by the way, at the end of this passage, Jesus says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. That's, that's crazy. So we are, we are saying to God when we pray that, God, I am so good at forgiving people that I'm asking you to forgive me to the same degree. I got to practice this yesterday. I, was, uh, I go to Disneyland all the time. And I was at downtown Disney, and my daughter had to pee. And am I allowed to say pee in church? I always look to the choir. <laughs> These are her words, not mine. She's a four-year-old, and she's potty trained, and she's, but she's not wearing a diaper, and she can have an accident. She's going, Daddy, I have to pee, I have to pee, I have to pee. And when that happens, you've got about a minute or two. <laughs> and, if you, and in about a minute or two, she's going to go no matter what. So, and all the spots are filled. So there's this one lady. And I'm like, walk, I'm like, she's walking speed and I'm going alongside her. And I follow her until she gets to her car because I need to park right away. And I got my, I blinkered it and everything. She pulls out and my daughter is going crazy because she has to pee and I'm in a hurry because otherwise she's going to like pee in the car. And as this car pulls away, it pulls out in a way that it blocks me and allows another car to pull in. And I followed her all the way at like a snail's pace. Like all the way through the parking lot, I was so, you know. And then I was just like, you know, it's trivial, it's not a big deal. And I was like really fighting myself. Those are the times when you can see how much you've really grown in Christ. <laughs> now what does a Christian do? A Christian just, it's not a big deal, it's trivial, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter in the great scheme of things. And of course I turned and I got a better parking spot, so God <laughs> rewarded me. <laughs> anyway. So God, I'm asking God, forgive me to the degree that I forgave that one mean lady that took my spot. <laughs> how much can I forgive her? That's how much I want you to forgive me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We often say deliver us from evil. It's the evil one. That refers to either the devil or it refers to evil people in your life. We're asking God. And so the prayer is so simple. It's essentially saying, you're our dad. You love us and you're here with us. We treasure and value and worship your name. And we can't do anything without you. And so we simply ask, give us today everything that we need. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive all of those around us and just continue to forgive them. And help us to lead good and righteous lives. 
You see, Jesus wants us to just be simple and not worry about our prayer life. It's very, very simple. When I was at the first church I was a part of, there was this pastor that was awesome. And, and there was a rumor that he used to pray three hours every morning. And I remember as an 18-year-old thinking, how could you pray three hours in total over the span of your life? How could you even do that? Because the way I pictured prayer was just coming up with stuff to say. And then I met a guy named Juan Carlos Ortiz. And uh, he taught me how to pray. Juan Carlos believes that prayer has much more to do with listening than it does talking. And he's right. Prayer has a lot more to do with not worrying and being in God's presence and listening to him. Juan Carlos told me he would just go to a river, and he's done this forever, and this is how he would pray. One day a week, he'd spend the whole day, he'd go to the special place by the river, he'd sit down and he'd say, all right, God, I'm here. And then just sit back against a tree and cross his arms. That's how Juan Carlos prays. And he's a spiritual giant. And I started doing that on Fridays eight years ago. Every Friday I do the same thing. And he is right. When you pray, don't worry. Prayer means creating space for you and God. And so I'm calling you out. I want you, if you want to be a real disciple of Jesus, to do more than go to church. I want you to take, just start by taking 15 or 20 minutes in the morning. Um, just a little time. And if you can't, you know, be awake like in your room, if you're falling asleep, go to a park or somewhere beautiful. Go to the beach. You, you know, everybody in the Midwest is angry at me right now. You, know, you can't go to the beach. You know, <laughs> it's cold outside. <laughs> go, go somewhere you love, somewhere beautiful. And, and just say, all right, Father, I'm here. And you can start with the Lord's Prayer. You just say, our Father, the one who fills the heavens, we treasure and value your name. We want what you want. Give us what we need, no more, no less. Lead us not into temptation. Help us to live righteous lives. Your kingdom, your power, your glory, and that's exactly how we want it. Can we do this? Can we all stand? And I'd like for us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Can you reach across the aisles and take the hands of the person that's standing next to you? I know this is a little weird. And we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And let's say debtors instead of trespassers, okay? We always get mixed up on that one. And let's do it slowly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to a 40-minute sermon today. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I had a chance uh, a few weeks ago to meet uh, Norman Vincent Peale's granddaughter, who is sort of the uh, face of his legacy. She'll be here next week, and I'm going to interview her. So it'll be Dr. Schuler's grandson interviewing Norman Vincent Peale's granddaughter. Her name is <laughs> Katie Berglandi, so that'll be great. Um, 
Thank you again for coming today. We want you to know how much we love you and that you're family to us and we care about you guys and love that you're here every week. For those of you who are watching us on the Hour of Power, we also love you and we hope that you'll like us on Facebook. We have all sorts of updates you can see on there all the time. Continue to watch and tell your friends about us. Thank you, friends, for coming. And now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, I'm Ed Arnold. The new year is here, and the Hour of Power is planning new and exciting programs to uplift and bring encouragement throughout 2014. Evaluating the effectiveness and positive benefits of each television channel this program airs on can be our biggest challenge, and that's where you come in. We need to know your viewing preferences. What channel do you watch the Hour of Power on in your home? If the Hour of Power happened to be available on your local ION station, would you watch that channel? How long have you watched the Hour of Power? Do you consider the Hour of Power your primary church? We want to be here for you every week, but we need your help to be effective. You may have already received our Hour of Power television survey in your mailbox. If you have, please complete it and return it to us as soon as possible. If you would like to take your survey online, go to hourofpower.org. Just look at the survey indicator and follow the instructions. We will say thank you by sending our Good Shepherd Hour of Power lapel pin. This one-of-a-kind pin displays the heartbeat of this ministry, belonging, healing, and learning. The letters are shaped in gold and set in a rich navy blue background. Wear this lapel pin as a proud supporter of the Hour of Power. We're asking for a gift of any size. With your donation today, the Hour of Power can and will be on the air each week, bringing you the most inspirational hour on television. The address is Hour of Power, Box 100, Garden Grove, California, or call toll-free 1-866-GET-HOPE. That's 1-866-438-4673. Of course, you can also go online and request your Good Shepherd lapel pin at hourofpower.org. When you do go online, be sure to take a few extra moments to complete the very short airtime survey that's posted there. Your survey will truly help us spend each dollar wisely. In Canada, the address is Hour of Power, Post Office Box 9050, Surrey, British Columbia, or call toll-free 1-866-581-7654. Of course, you can also go online at hourofpower.ca. Thank you again for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Please join us again next week and remember always that God loves you and so do we.